morning. Good morning. Good morning. God's word is going to be from Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 through 30. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or, or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation, and that from God. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here is in me. And now here it is in me. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So I want to apologize for the visual distraction. I had some skin surgery this week, which I tried to heal up quickly. Okay, I am going to uh, just say two words, and I want you to think uh, what immediately comes to your mind when I say these two words. And I want to set your mind at rest. I'm not going to ask anyone to share what comes to your mind, but it'll be interesting to see what pops into your mind when I say these two words. Here we go. Inescapable conflict. Inescapable conflict. But wouldn't it be interesting to know what came into everybody's mind with a thought like that? We think of how different people might respond to that. Think of a combat veteran who knows what it's like to have their life on the line and with uh, live ammunition and shrapnel exploding all around them, what those words would mean to them. Think of someone who feels trapped in a failing marriage, inescapable conflict. Wow, that's, that's in inescapable. The father or mother of a rebellious teenager trying to do everything they can for the child they love and just not seeing any way out from the problems. Someone battling opioid addiction. A policeman on duty in a riot zone. A 19-year-old young man in Ukraine. It's inescapable conflict. And how about adding this one to the list? Any and every genuine Christian, inescapable conflict, any and every genuine Christian. Second Timothy 3.12 says what? All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will, not might, but will suffer persecution. And our text in Philippians chapter 1 uh, that was read for us, verses 27 through 30, I just want to highlight the parts of this text that seem to point towards conflict. It says, Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together. That idea of having to strive, that there's conflict there. Striving together for the faith of the gospel. In no way alarmed by your opponents, Opponents, those who are against you, those who are setting themselves against you. Again, the context of um, conflict there. And then it says, For you it has been granted for Christ's sake not only believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Being called to and having to suffer speaks of conflict. And then verse 30, in my translation anyway, actually uses the word experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here to be in me. So if you are a genuine, born-again, spirit-indwelt believer, you have been born into, placed into, immersed in, inescapable conflict. We have no choice. We must fight. 
We can win or we can lose, but we're in a war. Amen. There's no, uh, no way out. And so our message this morning is an equipping message. It's a message designed to equip you as a soldier of Christ and myself as well to be able to have the victory. We're going to look at some things this morning from our text in Philippians at some essential things we need for victory in the conflict. Essentials for victory in the conflict. Let's pray together. Lord, if it were up to us, we probably would not choose to have the degree of conflict and strife and warfare that we need to face. But Lord, in your wisdom, you have not given us that choice. You've called us into the middle of the battle, but you've also promised to be with us and to equip us and give us all that we need for victory. So I pray for my brothers and sisters this morning, your sheep, your lambs, that this message would be helpful to them in the battle that they're in, that they can walk in your victory. Thank you and I pray in Jesus' name, amen. And so from our text, Philippians 1, 27 through 30, we're going to look at some essentials that we need for victory. And first of all, we must have, according to our text, a life worthy of the gospel. We must have it if we're going to walk in victory. We must have a life worthy of the gospel. And here we're focusing on the first half of verse 27. We could call it 27a where we, we read the words, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Conduct yourself, live your life in a manner that's worthy of the one that you profess, in a manner that's worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, just for interest's sake, let's consider some spheres of life where godly character is not essential to success. Okay, We say that it is, for the believer in spiritual warfare. But let's consider some spheres where it is not essential for success. Think of the world of sports. How many sports figures uh, have ended up uh, being caught out in domestic violence with their spouses or all sorts of other things, and yet they're considered a great success. They're viewed with envy and admiration by great numbers in our society, but godly character not essential to success there, or music. And when I think especially of, of the more modern styles of music and the way some, uh, the lifestyles of some of the rap artists and so on, maybe I'm being unfair to pick on rap. You can catch me about that afterwards, but uh, certainly not all of them are living in, in godly conduct and a godly lifestyle. Um, acting. Oh, did anyone hear about the Oscars recently? Oh boy. Was godly conduct being, <laughs> Tierra, was godly conduct being displayed at that point? I, I don't think so, somehow. Or business. How many people can get away with cheating and dishonesty in the business world and yet <laughs> prosper and be among the Fortune 500 or whatever it is? Oh, here's a controversial one, religious business. Religious business. Amen. Yeah, there are people out there who claim to be Christians and are building big religious empires. But if we could see, and sometimes we do get to see because things break out in the open, uh, what their lifestyles are, it's not always a godly lifestyle. lifestyle. But in Christian life and warfare, in con in contrast to these other areas, godliness is essential. It's a must have. It has to be there. As we see from the scriptures, we see that godliness is essential. First of all, there's no salvation without it. Hebrews 12, 14 speaks of pursuing peace and holiness or sanctification, it says, without which no one will see the Lord. Wow, it's pretty plainly stated, isn't it? We can kid ourselves, but the scriptures say, pursue being holy and sanctification without which no one is going to see the Lord. So godliness is essential 
for salvation. Again, not that we're saved by works or we're saved because we keep X standard of uh, consistent Christian living, just that those who truly know Christ will exhibit godliness as his spirit works that out in their lives. So no salvation without it, no power without it. We're focusing on how godliness is essential to victory in the Christian life. No power without it. It's true, the gospel does have intrinsic power. It's the power of God for the salvation to everyone who believes. But ungodly messengers will mar the message and eviscerate the power of the gospel. Not that God can't use his words spoken through unworthy vessels or even hypocritical vessels, but it's going to weaken and eviscerate the power of that saving message. No salvation without a godly life, no power without it, and certainly no long-term victory in the Christian warfare and conflict without a godly life. The key to long-term victory, not appearing to do well for a while and then having your life implode on you, but the key to long-term victory is abiding in Christ, Amen. dwelling in Him, yes. living in Him, settling in in Him for the long haul. And so we see that uh, an essential for victory in the conflict is a godly life. We need to have, we must have, a life worthy of the gospel of Christ. And perhaps the illustration that helps us understand this the best is the picture that's given of the, the Christian in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where we are referred to as ambassadors for Christ. Now imagine that you all of a sudden got tapped to be an ambassador to a certain country, say, uh, the United Kingdom or, or Great Britain, just to pick one, all of a sudden your life would change very drastically because what you do and the way you conduct yourself and the way you live and how much you drink or don't drink and the people you hang out with and the nature of, of your life with regard to uh, sexuality and so on, all of a sudden it doesn't just affect you. Everything you do is reflecting the country that you represent, the United States of America. You are now an ambassador, and everything you do reflects on your nation. So when we realize that we have called, been called to be ambassadors for Christ, it's a huge challenge to realize, whoa, wait a minute. I, I can't just live any way I feel like living. I can't just do anything I feel like doing. I can't just hang out with people that are unwise to hang out with because what I do now reflects on my God and my King. Amen. I am his ambassador. Success in the Christian life, in the Christian warfare, means we must have a life worthy of the gospel. Let's move along in our text. Again, uh, success in the Christian warfare means we must have corporate unity in contending for the gospel. Now, if it's not clear initially what I'm talking about here, hopefully it will be as we go along. Uh, we must have corporate unity, not individual in this case, but corporate, a body of believers, corporate unity in contending for the gospel. And here we're focusing on the remainder of Philippians 1.27. We read already, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And we continue, Paul says, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. It's talking about the unity within the church family, the unity within the body of believers. So here is a virtue that we must have that isn't an individual virtue. It has to do with our corporate identity. It has to do with who we are as a body of Christ. Now, uh, Heather, we are so delighted that it meant something to you to become a member of this church. Amen. And I think that's just such a good point of challenge for us to realize 
how much do we identify ourselves as members or at least adherents and attenders of his body so that it makes a difference to us whether this church is prospering, is striving, is being effective in reaching people for Christ, in discipling people and build, building them up. Is that an important aspect of life to you and I, that we are part of a local church, that it really means something to us? And in a proper sense, we take pride in that and we're delighted that we could be numbered among this body of believers right. here in Stone Ridge. So if we are as a corporate body now, not speaking of ourselves individually, are to be effective for Christ, if we are to uh, have victory in the spiritual warfare, we must have corporate unity in contending for the gospel. We have to be united. Amen. And this is the first time in Philippians that the theme of unity has kind of surfaced. But as we go through the book, um, we're going to see it again and again, that this is one of the themes of the book of Philippians, is the importance of unity. Now, I tried to think of an illustration of the importance of being united, and I thought of a rowing team or a varsity crew. And I sent this to our technical people and uh, sent them a link, and they said, sure, we can put it up. Jasper, thank you. What a great, look at those guys pulling together, right? Pulling together. Now imagine for a moment if every one of those guys, this I think was a Harvard, that's the Charles River there in Boston, Cambridge. Uh, this I think was Harvard and Penn State and Navy having a, a match here. But you can imagine one of these teams, if every one of those individual rowers was in great shape, the strongest that they could be, um, if their technique was flawless and impeccable, but if they weren't rowing together, one's doing it at one time, one's doing it at the other time, they're here, there, and everywhere with regard to synchronizing their timing, it would be a, it would be a disaster. Wouldn't matter how strong any one of those individual guys was, it would be a complete uh, washout. Wow, what, what a great job. Let's hear it for our tech team over here. Yeah. All right, so what, this gives us such a good picture of the importance of unity. If we are going to be victorious, that we have corporate unity as the body of Christ. And let me ask this question that might on the surface to be uh, too self-congratulatory for us as a body, but I, I think it's justified and warranted. Why has EFC been as potent and successful as a church? I can speak pretty close to at least for the last 15 years, why have we seen the good results we've seen? We've been able to see people come to Christ. We've been able to see people built up. We've been able to see ministries established and sustained. We've been able to see a place where people can come, anyone who has a hunger, and count on the fact that they're going to hear the gospel and they're going to hear the truth. The re one of the reasons, one of the key reasons we have been as successful as the church as we have been, and again, not that we can't do more or that we can't improve, surely we can, but is that we have been united as a body. Yeah. And we really have been. I've been a part of a lot of churches, and I've seen my share of church conflict and backbiting and gossip and people saying things that tear down brothers and sisters and uh, people, you know, not being charitable toward the leadership of the church, but tearing them down and undermining them. I, I've seen that in so many different churches, but mercifully, we have been spared that here. Thank God for his faithfulness and his keeping of us here. And it's because of that, that even though we're a small church in a remote location, we have a lampstand for the Lord that I believe is shining brightly to this day, and we are being effective in seeing people come to Christ and Amen. be built up. So uh, after you leave here, you can, if you can reach, you can pat, pat yourself on the back a, a little bit. But let, let me warn us about something else. While you're patting yourself on the back, you might notice that there's also a target painted on your back. Amen. Okay, because... The, the adversary, we're told we fight not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, powers, 
demonic spirits in heavenly places. They're not happy about that. And you better believe they have targeted that unity here. If they could have taken it down over the last 15 years, they would have. But because of the faithful prayers of many, they haven't been able to. So we are called to continuing vigilance in that. We cannot allow negativity or gossip or backbiting or disunity to have any foothold in this place. We need the presence of the Holy Spirit and His grace and power to be so strong that if any one of us at any time would begin to, to speak negatively of another brother and sister, we would immediately be convicted of that. Amen. We would say, wait a minute, what am I doing? There's no place for this in my life. And by the way, if anyone comes to you with a juicy piece of negativity about a brother and sister in Christ, you don't have to judge them. You can just say, you know what? I really don't need to hear this right now. Amen. Have you gone to the person themselves and talked it over with them? Or if need be, have you brought it to the leadership of the church? So we need to be vigilant, not, uh, not, not simply to pat ourselves on the back for God doing a good thing in our midst, but to realize that there are targets on our back and we must stand in that unity. We must continue in that unity if we want to continue to be fruitful for the Lord. Ephesians 4.3 says, Strive, fight, to make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So we, we're forewarned, right? Yeah, the enemy's going to probe. He's going to try to attack at that point. But we strive to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Okay, going on to a third essential for victory in the conflict. If we're going to have victory in that inescapable conflict, we must have courage in the face of opposition. We must have courage in the face of opposition. And here we're up to Philippians 1.28 where Paul says we are, be, we are to be striving together for the faith of the gospel, and then he goes on, in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. So Paul is saying, don't be intimidated, don't be alarmed, don't be uh, discouraged from pressing on, because there are fierce opponents arrayed against you. We must have courage in the face of opposition. Conflict describes our overarching situation. We're in the midst of conflict, but opposition is seeing the other guy's face across the battle line. That's where it gets real. We have opponents, demonic opponents, and at times we will have opponents on the terrestrial earthly level too, who try to hinder what God wants to do in our lives and in the lives of this church fellowship. So uh, let's remember when we talk about having opponents, these are not athletic opponents, okay? We're, we're not out for a game of cricket here if I were in Britain. I don't know. Can you picture cricket? You guys swinging a bat? It looks a little like baseball, but uh, not exactly. We're, we're not talking about that kind of opponent. We're not talking about a badminton opponent. We're not even talking about a rugby opponent where it does get pretty, uh, pretty difficult and pretty painful on the playing field. No, we're talking about military components. We're, opponents. We're talking about those who are out to destroy you. Those who are out to destroy your testimony in Christ. Those who are out to rip your family apart. Those who are out to take down this church because they hate the fact that we stand for Jesus Christ and are being effective for him. So we need courage in the face of opposition. Now, the best time period to illustrate this in is during the reign of Saul with Israel and the Philistines. Uh, we won't turn there, but I think 1 Samuel chapter 18. And of course, we have a couple face-offs there. We have at the corporate level, at the larger level, the armies of Israel are facing off across the valley with the armies of Philistia. They're facing off day after day. And then it comes down to the individual level where as the situation develops, 
eventually David is facing off against Goliath. Situations of opponents, Israel and Philistia, David and Goliath. And how, how did this all work out? Well, before we look at that, I would say the key factor is the presence or absence of courage. The key factor in the way these battle lines are going to go and, and the result of the battle goes is the presence or absence of courage. C.S. Lewis was the one who said that courage is the indispensable virtue because without it, all the other virtues just collapse under pressure. They, they may be good to be loving, to be gracious, to be kind. All those things are good. But, but what if you're only loving so long as, and the minute the pressure comes on, the minute the attack comes, that that all falls apart. Uh, so courage is the indispensable virtue, and it's the presence or absence of courage in this uh, situation where we have opponents that's going to decide the outcome. Now, going back to our illustrative time uh, with Israel and the Philistines, in the absence of courage with, in Israel, the Philistines humiliated Israel. Do you remember? It was 40 days that Goliath came out every single day, just driving it home. Give me a man to fight with me. And they were all shaking in their boots, including King Saul. Nobody would come out. And Israel was humiliated because of the lack of courage. But then on the one-on-one one -on -one conflict, when David stood out and faced Goliath, he triumphed because of his unflinching courage. You come against me with sword and shield and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of the armies of Israel, whose armies you have defied. And today, I'm going to give your body to the beasts of the field. David was not lacking in courage. He came out with confidence, took his sling, and ran toward God. By the way, don't call it a slingshot. If I had a dollar for every time someone talked about David, no, David wasn't... Uh, that, that, was, that wasn't... It. It was a sling, not a slingshot. But David met Goliath with unflinching courage and won a great victory. Now here's the part that I want to get to. So in the absence of courage, the Philistines humiliated Israel with undaunted courage, unflinching flinching courage. David triumphed over Goliath. But then with derivative courage, and we'll think about the meaning of that word because it's an important word. With derivative courage, Israel then triumphed over the Philistines. It's because they saw what David had done, because they were inspired by the courage of their captain, that these same people who had been intimidated for 40 days, shaking in their boots, all of a sudden rose up and pursued the Philistines and won a huge victory over them. It wasn't because of their own strength and ability. It was because of the courage of their captain, and that courage became infectious to them, and they rose up with a derivative courage that they derived from David and went and won a tremendous victory. You know, I've reflected on this a little at times, that when you read a Bible story like David and Goliath, at least when we're young, you know, we immediately put ourselves in the role of David and we just say, yeah, that's me. I'm, I'm, if I got to plug myself into that story, I'm David. Well, I reached a point in my life where I, I had to be a little more honest and said, you know what? I, I don't think I'm, I'm David in that story. I think I'm one of those other soldiers out there that just by no means wanted to stand up against that giant. I have to put myself in that position. And that, that seems almost like putting yourself in, in a position of defeat, but that's not the end of the story. Because while I can't put myself in David and say, oh, if I had lived back then, I would have been David. I wouldn't have been one of those cowardly soldiers there. No, I could well have been one of those cowardly soldiers. But even though I might not be David, I could be one of those soldiers who rose to the occasion once their champion had stepped forward 
and said, we can do this. And I'm getting up with my brothers and sisters and the people of God and going forward to do what God has called me to do. Not because I'm the superhero, but because I have a captain of faith who is the superhero. I have the Lord Jesus Christ who is strong and mighty in battle. I have the Lord Jesus Christ who's full of courage and confidence. And as I have come to know him, and as he lives in me through his spirit, I have that derivative courage. And I have that victory, not because I'm, I'm the great one, but because I follow my captain Amen. to victory. Amen. And to me, that kind of pulls that David and Goliath story uh, in, into line for me. Yeah, I could wish I could say, oh, I would have been David back then. But once I realized that probably I wouldn't have been, by the way, there was only one David for how many thousands of Israel soldiers. So even the numbers are against me. Okay. I, I, I probably would not have been David, but I could have been one of those who rose up in the courage of my captain to pursue the victory. As the hymn writer said, uh, not of man the power, not to man the fame. We are victors only in our leader's name. Amen. Cross of Christ lead onward through the holy war. In this sign we conquer now and evermore. And isn't it interesting that even back in our text, uh, verse 28 of Philippians chapter 1, in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but a salvation for you. And what does it say? And that too from God. It says it right out in the text. That victory, that, that which brings destruction to the enemy and brings victory to the believer, it's from God. That comes from God. That comes from our Savior. That comes from our glorious captain. And it's in him that we triumph. It's in him that we have the victory. And quickly going on to one more essential that we must have for victory in this inescapable conflict that we're in, we must have courage to face suffering. We must have courage to face suffering. And we go on to verses 29 and 30, where Paul says, For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. So it is inescapable that we are in a conflict. As we've seen it, it is inescapable that we have fierce opponents, that we face opposition. It is inescapable that we will suffer. We will, not we might, or it could happen, we will suffer. What does it say? For you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Boy, could I, could I opt out of that nice gift? You've, been, you've granted it. How, why don't you give that one to Alan back there instead? I'll, I'll let him have that nice gift, okay? No, we, we can't do that. It's been granted to us as believers as Amen. part of our calling, as part of our life, Amen. that in one way or another, to one level or another, we will suffer for the sake of Christ. Many of you have already suffered in your life. Now, what we're really focusing on here is suffering for the sake of Christ, right? And your suffering is part of the human condition for everybody in any case. But when we suffer for his namesake because of faithfulness to the gospel, that's the kind of suffering that we're focusing on here. It has been granted to you for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict, Paul says, which you saw in me and now here to be in me. So we see the progression from conflict, which sounds rugged enough, from conflict to suffering, from conflict to suffering. Peter and the disciples were all for conflict. Let me at him, Lord. Peter's got his sword out. He's ready to hack off the servant of the high priest's ear. I'm all, I'm all in for conflict. But suffering? No. No, Peter, who said he would never deny Christ, 
when he was faced with the real danger of the situation with the Jews rising up, how all of a sudden uh, he wasn't so courageous, he wasn't so strong. So uh, we want to say conflict, yeah, suffering, no. But God says, no, that's not an option. We will suffer what's been granted to us for Christ's sake. And by the way, um, it's not just Peter that would want to avoid suffering. Don't we all? Yes. Don't we all want to avoid suffering? Well, let's think of some examples of suffering for the gospel, for the sake of Jesus. Paul gives us a good example of remaining faithful through suffering. Uh, I didn't uh, look up to read the text, but he talks about some of the things he's gone through. He was beaten with rods. He spent nights out in the open with no place to sleep. He was shipwrecked. He uh, you know, had people r rise up and turn against him in the churches that, that he was trying to plant. And Paul's whole life from the time he came to Christ is just a catalog of sufferings of things that, that he went through that uh, called for incredible endurance on his part. Of course, Jesus gives us a supreme example of strength and undaunted courage through suffering. When the disciples slept, Jesus stayed awake and shed, as it were, great uh, drops of blood in the Garden of, of Gethsemane because he knew that the flesh, uh, that the spirit was willing, but the flesh was weak. Jesus, who for, we're told for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, uh, the supreme example of courageous suffering. But the one who really gives us a reality check on our human frailty when we are called to suffer is, of course, again, Peter. Peter, who says, Lord, I'll never deny you, and then ended up denying the Lord three times. Peter, who uh, talked a good game, but prior to the day of Pentecost, uh, lacked the courage to submit to suffering and to, to uh, go through the fiery trials that God had called him to go through. But uh, Peter's a good one to focus on because that wasn't the whole story with him. After the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came upon him, now we're getting back to that derivative courage again, right? The courage that's not our own, but we receive it from our king and our captain and our leader. After the Holy Spirit came on Peter, then he was a new man. He, on the, in his message on Pentecost, he faced down the Jewish leaders. He said, you have by wicked hands crucified the Messiah, the Son of God. He faced them with it. Um, when he went out and was witnessing in the public squares of Jerusalem, and they told him he had to shut up and not teach any more in this name. He said, you decide what's right for, for you, whether to obey God or man. But as for us, we cannot help speaking his name and preaching him. When they were threatened uh, and then flogged after being uh, flogged and whipped, they went back to the upper room and prayed for boldness. And the place where they were was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word in boldness. So Peter is, is a good example again of the fact that we may not have the courage to face suffering in ourselves, but if we abide in Christ, if we draw our strength from him, if we look to him as our glorious captain in the battle, then we can enjoy that victory. And of course, Peter, we are told in uh, Subsequent church history was crucified upside down, uh, dying a martyr's death out of faithful love for Jesus. And let's never forget the fact that we are promised grace for suffering at the time that we need it. We may not think we have what it takes to go through suffering or even to face martyrdom if God would call us to that. But God has said at the time he'll give you what you need. At the time, you won't just have it all in advance. Like, oh, I, I got this, no problem. I have got all my ducks in a row. I know just how I'm going to go through this. No, it's it's more like you feel tremendously vulnerable. You don't know how you're going to get through the suffering. And God says, I'll be with you. 
cannot give you the grace that you need Amen. as the occasion arises. So, uh, perhaps a, a message to prepare us for something that's coming. I don't like to think that something of a difficult nature is coming on any of us as individuals or us as a church body. But in our text in Philippians 1, uh, we've had our attention drawn to the, this matter of inescapable conflict. We've had our attention drawn to the fact that the Christian life is a warfare. We've had our attention drawn to the fact that there are certain things we need to have if we're going to win in that battle, rather than be defeated if we're going to win. And so uh, I just wanted to have some key words up on the screen for our closing here. And uh, just to say them, conflict, opposition. Oh, wow, these guys, these guys are tops with that technical <laughs> theme here. Suffering, overcomers, unity, victory. Let's hear it again for the tech team. And I, I really should have put courage in there too. I realized that afterwards. But just to have those words in front of us, just a couple questions to think about in closing uh, in the focus of our message. Do you want to be an ambassador for Christ? Do you want to be? Now, the answer for some might be no. <laughs> I, I want to follow Jesus and go to heaven, but that level of scrutiny and challenge that goes with being his ambassador, boy, I, I'd rather take a pass. Well, guess what? We can't, okay? If we're going to be a believer, if we're going to follow Jesus, we are ambassadors for Christ. Then know this, godly character is essential. It's not a maybe. We cannot live a life of open sin and be effective ambassadors for the Holy One, the King of Kings. Another question, do we as a church want to be effective ministers of the gospel? Then continued unity is essential. I'm so glad I don't have to exhort us to get unified because I believe we are unified and have maintained that unity, as I said, for at least 15 years. But we don't rest on our laurels. We vigilantly guard that unity. Amen. We continue it. We focus on our, our captain and our king who draws us together. We're like those rowers that row together so that we can really accomplish something for the Lord. And do we want to be long-term victors in the escapable conflict? Long-term victors, not those who are ahead at points and then get knocked out by some uh, unexpected blow. Then know for sure, courage is essential. It's not uh, some extra thing that would be nice to have. If we're gonna be long-term victors, Courage is essential. Courage to face opposition, and even more, courage to endure suffering. Amen. So let's pray that God will give us out of his riches and grace in Christ Jesus everything that we need individually and as a church body to be faithful and effective for him. And as we pray, we will begin to turn our thoughts also towards the communion that we'll be sharing together. Father, thank you so much for your love and your goodness. Thank you that you want to equip us through your word. As we continue through the book of Philippians, we've come across this passage that speaks so clearly of the opposition we will face, the suffering we'll go through, but how we can do it victoriously through our captain's power, through his grace, through his love through his providing all that we need. So bless my brothers and sisters. May this word stick with us and build us up so that we can all walk in your victory. And also as a body, as a fellowship, we can rejoice in the unity and love that you continue to minister to us here at EFC. We thank you and we pray in Jesus' name. <coughs> Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Ben. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 We're going to come to the time of communion in a few moments here. I just want to remind folks that communion is a time in which we remember the suffering of Christ. The invitation is for all here to participate, who have accepted, believe, and confess Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord. However, if that is not the case, we want to give you a chance to do that before we go to communion this morning, if God has so prompted your heart. At this point, I'm going to ask Alan and Rick if you could join me up here in a moment to pass out the emblems. These are emblems, the bread representing the body of Christ, the juice representing the blood that we shed on Calvary. And as the emblems are going to be passed out to you at this time, I think it's appropriate that we sing our closing song. I know you can't hold the purple book in your hands if you don't know the words, but you might. It's Praise 110, Change My Heart, O God, because part of the communion message that is given to us by Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 warns about the time of searching our hearts to make sure that our heart is right with God before we come to this communion table. It should be a time of reflection as we've been challenged today by the word and through the power of the spirit to make sure that we are in a right place with him. Again, as the emblems are pointed out, please hold on to both the emblems. And again, if you can sing with us, sing along. And if not, just let it be a time that you prepare to come into his presence. It's number 110, Change My Heart. Gentlemen. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. You are the potter, I am the clay. what I pray. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. One more time. Change my heart, oh for a moment of silent prayer as we prepare our hearts to receive these emblems this morning. Father, as David prayed, to search my heart, O Lord, and see if there be any sinful way in me. O Father God, I think of the prayer, Father of Samuel Langdon, on the day before the Battle of Bunker Hill in 1775, where he said, Lord, may my camp be free of every accursed thing. May this land be purged of all its sin. May every town and every city be filled with his Holy Spirit. Well, Father, may it begin in our hearts here today that, Father, as we come into this time of remembering the suffering, 
the death that you died on the cross for us. Father God, that we would rededicate our lives to you. And that if there be anyone here this morning who has never accepted Christ into their heart and life, ask him to forgive them of their sins, believe that he was raised from the dead, that if they wish to accept him this morning, they will. Perhaps even those that are listening online this morning, if you're hearing these words and you wish to accept Christ, just say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I accept you as my Savior and Lord and believe that you were raised from the dead and your sins are forgiven. Well, Father God, we thank you. We praise you. We thank you for the sacrifice you made upon the cross at Calvary. May we never, never lose sight of it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Paul writes the following in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. On the night of the Lord's Supper, he said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. Helen, would you ask the blessing on the bread? Sure. Dear Holy Father, we ask your blessing upon this bread. And, uh, we know it's a symbol of all that your son did for us, Father, how his body was broken in order to pay the penalties for our sin, Father. And the, the love that you showed for us is uh, un, something that's hard to understand. We thank you so much for it, Father, and help us to love you in return. I thank you for Jesus. it in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The scripture reads, and when they had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us partake together. Thank you, Lord. And in the same way, he took the cup also. Rick, will you ask the blessing upon the Jews, please? I want to thank you, Lord, for, for this gift you've given to all of us, Lord, your son gave us a way to come to you, Father. And uh, I just thank you, Lord, for the shedding of blood yes. of your son. <clears throat> we read in the same way he took the cup and also after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us partake together. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And Lord, come quickly, we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. The, uh, the ushers will pick up your cups as they come around. Will you, once you pass them on, stand with me as a sign of the unity and the bond of faith that we have in Christ. And as a body of believers here, you know, as Ned was sharing, I just see how God orchestrates and brings the hand of the word into our hearts and lives. If you recall from John 17 last week, part of Jesus' prayer to his father was, they stay, they don't go, Lord. He said that to his father. He wanted us to remain here because it is through us that God will bring the light of salvation into the hearts of people around us. We need to be here. So don't fight it. Submit to it, rejoice in it, and let God take us forward. Let us pray. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we praise you, we exalt you, and we thank you, Father, for all that you have done today, for the anointing upon Ned and the message that he brought, so encouraging in the aspect of the unity that we are to have in you and as a body of believers. Oh, Father God, continue to work in our hearts and lives. Continue to guide us. Father, lead us, Father, according to thy will and purpose until we are joined together again. Bless the food and the fellowship that will follow. We ask in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Make sure that you greet one another. Please stay for fellowship. And until we see you next week, God bless you all.